What are we doing? That's what you get when you get into a rush. We welcome you to our worship this morning on the last Sunday of the church year, which means that next Sunday begins a new church year with the season of Advent. But this is also a special Sunday for us. We're going to be recognizing... Um, I call it Seniors Recognition Sunday as we recognize the seniors in our congregation. Um, and we're limiting it to, uh, to those who are, have been blessed with 75 or more years. Um, that's just an arbitrary number. Um, and why do we do this? We observe this day because God calls upon us to show respect for the elderly. That's Leviticus 19 verse 32. And this is just one small way in which we can do that. This year, we identified 17 individuals within our congregation who were 75 or older. We're happy for the presence of many of them in our service today, and happy that so many of them are also among our most regular and faithful church attenders. Um, I could go through this list, but maybe I'll wait and let you know just who's on this list um, at the service or at the program um, after today's worship. Our order of service for today is Divine Service Setting 1, which begins on page 151 in the front part of your hymnal. Uh, we open with the hymn, Now Thank We All Our God, and there's a little note about that. Uh, listen for that one phrase, particularly in the one that stands us in our, in our hymn number 895.
1, divine service, setting 1. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, relieve us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake. God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he, is, he, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us Bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. The intro for this Sunday is from Psalm 134. The antiphon that introduces it from Psalm 33. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. We continue now with the Kyrie, the Lord have mercy, page 152. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. For our hymn of praise, we sing number 548.
you. you. Let us pray. Most gracious God, you have promised to be with your people even unto old age. Grant that those whom you have blessed with the gift of many years may even yet be moved the more to join in thanking you for all the bounty of your overflowing hand. Continue to uphold them with strength and dignity and grant understanding and compassion to those who you provide to show your love and care. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may follow the scripture readings from the back of your bulletin. Sometimes God's faithful people wonder whether there is a God who governs and judges when evildoers seemingly prosper. It seems futile to serve God. The day, however, is coming when God will judge the world, and the difference between those who serve God and those who do not will become terrifyingly clear. The Old Testament reading for the last Sunday of the church year is from Malachi chapter 3. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord, but you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our epistle lesson may include an early Christian hymn on the supremacy of Christ, which the Apostle Paul quotes to counteract false teaching at Colossae, which robbed Christ of his glory as Savior. Christ is called the image of God, emphasizing that Christ, who is the eternal Son of God and who became the God-man, reflects and reveals God. Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, not in the sense that he was created first, but that he is over all creation. Indeed, by him all things were created. By his death on the cross, Christ has made peace between God and man. The epistle is from Colossians chapter 1. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our gospel lesson takes us to Jerusalem and to Calvary, where Christ was crucified. It concludes with the account of the penitent thief on the cross who pleads with Jesus to remember him when Jesus comes into his kingdom. An amazing expression of faith given the circumstances. King Jesus gives personal assurance to the new believer. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Paradise being the abode of the righteous dead as they await resurrection. I just happened to see a a blog on, on the internet uh, this past week, and uh, I thought it was really quite appropriate. Um, what do you think the thief on the cross said when he stood before God at death, and, and God says, why should I let you in here? And I thought this was good, because the man on the cross said I could come. I like that. 
Well, let's rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 23rd chapter. There followed Jesus a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. And they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left, Jesus, leaving Jesus in the middle. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We join in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, <coughs> page 158 in the front part of your hymnal. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead and I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Maybe seated. We continue with number 733, O oh God, our help in ages past.
and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text that I have chosen for this Senior's Recognition Sunday is Psalm 92, verses 12 through 15. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. To declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. This is the text. Dear Christian friends, when 100-year-old Jack Borden was asked the secret of his long life, he instantly replied, not dying. I think he was on to something. What he realized, and what we all surely realize, that aging is the only way to live. Yes, aging is the only way to live. But how do we react to aging? For most young people, aging is a process that proceeds at much too slow a pace. They're eager for their next birthday to come. Perhaps you were the youngest member in your family and wished that, he could, you, that you could be as old as your older brother or sister so that you could enjoy the same privileges that were denied you because you were too young. It would seem that most young people who are 13 years old can't wait till they're 16, and if they're 18, they can't wait until they're 21. But as we get older, the addition of years is often greeted with far less enthusiasm. We look longingly back to our, back to our younger years. We look forward to birthdays about as eager, eagerly as we look forward to a trip to the dentist to get a root canal. Perhaps you are one of those dreading the fact that you are nearing the big 4-0 or the big 5-0 or whatever big O you happen to be approaching. One birthday card captured this feeling when it compared birthdays to bumper stickers. You enjoy other people's, but you don't really want one for yourself. But then birthdays do have their place. At the doctor's office, the elderly lady complained that she wasn't feeling well. I'm doing all I can to help you, said the doctor. You know I can't make you young again. I don't want to be young again, the woman replied. I just want to keep on getting older. The title of the song I remember hearing in Germany in 1975 says it well. Du kannst nicht immer siebzehn sein. You can't always be 17. Look it up on YouTube. Great little song. As each new day arrives, we become without fail a day older. In light of that fact, I would recommend the optimistic outlook expressed in another birthday card as it commented on the subject of aging. You might be older than, you, than you've ever been before, but you're younger than you'll ever be again. Older Americans are a growing part of our population. You can't help but recognize that we are witnessing the graying of America. In the U.S., the population aged 65 and older numbered 54.1 million in 2019, and those are the latest statistics that I could find. They represented 16% of the population, more than one in every seven Americans. Since 1900, the percentage of Americans aged 65 and older nearly quadrupled. And the number increased more than 17 times. <laughs> Back to the sermon. <laughs> the older population itself became increasingly older. In 2019, the 65 to 74 age group, 31.5 million, was more than 14 times larger than in 1900. The 75 to 84 group, 16 million, was 20 times larger. And the 85 
plus group 6.6 6 million was more than 53 times larger than in 1900. While society often places a premium on youth, often ignoring or overlooking the elderly in our midst, we want to place a premium on every age category, whether you're youth, young adult, middle age, or senior, knowing that God calls us to be productive all the days of our lives. There may be changes, as, in, changes in what we can and can't do as years go by, but that still doesn't change the fact that as the psalmist reminds us, we can still bear fruit in old age. In whatever age we find ourselves, we need to ask ourselves the question, what has God called me to be and to do at this point in my life? The answer is probably different today than it was five or ten years ago and will likely be different in another five or ten years. However we answer, the point is that God is never really done with us so long as we're alive. He has a plan for our lives from cradle to grave. I believe that I can safely say that one of the goals for most people in life is a happy retirement. They spend years saving and planning for the day when they can retire and free up their lives so that they can do what interests them without the demands of a job always pressing down upon them. But we need to ask the question whether the concept of retirement applies also to work in God's kingdom. While we may rightly retire from secular jobs, what about our service to our Lord? Physical infirmities and limitations may sometimes be a hindrance, especially as we get older, but is that a valid reason for retiring from the work of the church? Based on what the scripture says, the answer can only be no. For the Christian, retirement should never mean retiring from Christian service. God has work for us to do at every age and stage of our lives. Always abound in the work of the Lord, Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Remember how he continues? Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. That word always challenges us to keep on doing the Lord's work no matter what age we are. And there is this added incentive. There is no task done for him that God considers useless. Any work, any labor that is done for him accomplishes his purpose. But Paul says in the New Testament is backed up by the Old Testament as well, as evidenced by our text. Now, in our text, we find a reference to the righteous. But just who are they? The term righteous is one of the many terms used to describe God's people. Those who have been justified or declared righteous by God. By the grace of God, they are enabled to live rightly, righteously as well. Though you and I are poor, miserable sinners, as we confess in the other confession that we didn't use today. Though we are poor, miserable sinners, we too are righteous because of the forgiveness which is ours on account of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, God's own Son. We don't claim a righteousness of our own, but only that which is credited to us for Christ's sake. In a happy exchange, our Lord takes our sin and gives us in turn, in return, His obedience, His righteousness. Having lived the holy life that we were meant to live, Christ died the death our sins deserved. He did this not for himself, but for us. His resurrection was God's sign of approval, his seal of approval on it all. Through faith now in him, faith which the Holy Spirit creates, we are now righteous in God's sight. So these words describe us, you and me and everyone who believes. 
Returning to our text, we see that the righteous are described by the psalmist as palm trees and cedar trees, flourishing in the house and courts of God. Whether or not in the Old Testament days trees were actually planted and grew in the courts of the temple <coughs> at Jerusalem, we can't say for sure. The psalmist is probably using figurative language to convey the thought that God's people flourish because of their nearness to God, the temple being the place of his residence. He is their source of life and strength. They, work, they know where to find God, where to be near God. Now, there are several characteristics of palm trees that make them especially relevant to the psalmist's application. For one thing, they have a long lifespan, over 100 years. They're very productive. They offer shade. They're used for thatch, lumber, and rope. And they bear their best fruit in old age. Well, God has brought himself near to us in what we call the means of grace. These means of grace are often, though not exclusively, associated with the gathering of God's people around word and sacrament in church. Today's version of the house of the Lord. Here God delivers to, the, to us the very forgiveness which Christ earned by his obedient life and sacrificial death. Whether we're speaking, speaking of the written word, the spoken and preached word, that's what's happening right now, the word that we have previously memorized that we've hidden in our hearts and later bring forth in remembrance, that's just another form of the the written word, but now we place it here in a heart. Or the word that is joined to physical elements of water in holy baptism, or bread and wine in holy communion. These means have great power, divine power, to impart faith as well as to nurture and strengthen faith. And where there is such faith, good works naturally follow. Christians are enabled and empowered to serve God and serve their, their neighbor in ways that please God. Such people are described in the text as ever full of sap and green, the marks of a healthy, growing tree. Even advancing years do not diminish their ability to serve in God's kingdom. The Bible is full of examples of God's use of older people in his service, people who were still bearing fruit, even in old age. Moses was 80 years old, and his brother Aaron was 83 when God sent them to speak to the Egyptian Pharaoh and lead the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage. These two were already past the normal lifespan described by Moses in Psalm 90, verse 10. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. And yet they were just embarking on a great adventure for God. We could add Joshua and Daniel and many others as further Old Testament examples. In the New Testament, we're introduced to two godly saints, Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist. Luke the Evangelist describes these two as advanced in age, in years. In spite of their age, Zechariah was still serving in the temple. And Elizabeth gave birth to John, the forerunner of Jesus, of, of, uh, of Jesus. Two others who figure prominently in the account of Christ's infancy are Simeon and Anna. These two elderly people bore witness to the Christ child when Jesus was brought to the temple by his parents for the presentation of the firstborn. Anna herself was at least 84 years and is described by Luke as one who worshipped with fasting and prayer night and day. Although Simeon was ready to depart in peace, a possible clue to his age, I'm sure he spent his remaining days, perhaps even years, sharing the good news of the Savior's birth. These biblical examples 
could easily be extended. They're enough to make the point that God uses people for his purposes even in old age. He uses the young with their enthusiasm and energy, and he uses the aged with their greater wisdom and experience. He wants to use each of us here today. While physical infirmities as we age may limit what we can do, only death can stop us from doing what we can. There's always a need for service that older adults can provide. Not all, but many elderly are financially secure and able to make contributions which younger families cannot. Not all, but many elderly have time available to call on members or prospects, visit the sick and shut-ins, volunteer for service to the church and the community. Even those confined to their homes can do things like send cards, make phone calls, or pray for others. At any age, God invites the righteous to witness to their faith and trust in God, to declare that the Lord is upright, that He is their rock, and there is no unrighteousness in Him. You see, they can't help but speak of the goodness and greatness of God, the God of their salvation. Even those who are confined to a nursing home or hospital room can testify to the goodness and love of God to all who visit them and to the caregivers who serve them. One thing I learned in my ministry that I could find the greatest encouragement, perhaps, in the shut-ins that I visited. By their witness to me, they did more for me than I did, I think, for them. I'll always remember Emily Schwartz, one of my shut-ins whom I visited in a nursing home back in Enid, telling me that she prayed for me daily. And then this was what really took me. In fact, she prayed for every one of her pastors going back years. If you are young, if you are old, God can use you. Because of what Jesus has done for you, you have life with God now and life in heaven still to come. But until that day, he has work for you to do. I see evidence of that in the faces that I see here before me in these pews. You can still bear fruit in old age. Bear fruit in any age. <clears throat> that was true in the past and is still true today. May God enable and empower you to keep loving and serving Him all the days of your life. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
In our list of prayers, and of course many of them continue, um, Jim Wheat is still recovering from a mishap that he had at home, um, resting, I guess, with his lawnmower. And, uh, but he's, he's getting along, I think, better. Just cannot be able to be here this morning. Others with various health issues, we've mentioned Karen, um, Chloe, infant daughter, great-granddaughter of Leroy, and Doreen, Natasha, Ken, Bernie, Harry, Donna, Sky, Warren, and Larry. And uh, of course we always give uh, a moment to include others that may also come to your mind and enter on your hearts as well. Let us pray. O Christ our King, live forever. You have made peace for us by the blood of your cross. You have pleaded with the Father for our pardon, and through you all things are reconciled to God. By your Spirit lead us to never-ending joy and thanksgiving that you have redeemed us by your passion from wrath and damnation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Christ our King, you have delivered us from the domain of darkness and transformed, transferred us into your kingdom. In you we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Guard your congregation and your ministers and preserve your word among us. Rule over your church with the forgiveness of sins and work all things together for her good until at last we rise with, with you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Christ our King, by your atoning death, we are separated, we are, we are spared as sons and estimated as treasured possessions of the Father. Bless all Christian homes that as the children of your kingdom, we would grow in the fear of the Lord and esteem your name, serve you faithfully, and walk in your charge, undismayed by the prosperity of the wicked, until all is revealed at the last day. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Christ our King, let the earth fear you, and all of the worlds in heaven stand in awe of you, for you alone are King of kings and Lord of lords. Preserve those who fear you and serve you in the midst of this fallen world, and maintain good government among us. Nevertheless, come quickly, Lord Jesus, for our citizenship is with you in paradise. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. O Christ our King, have mercy and deliver us from evil. For our sins, we have deserved only just condemnation and calamity, yet you have remembered us from your cross and given us access to the Father in your name. Deliver the troubled, the sick, and the dying, and preserve them in your kingdom forever. We pray especially for those that we have named, but now we also name others in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our O Christ our King, you saved us, and not yourself, for you are indeed the Christ of God, his chosen one. Your body was given for us, and your blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. In this, your most holy supper, do not let us weep in remembrance of you, but mourning our own sins, let us taste your kingdom's pleasure in faith and be strengthened to life everlasting. <clears throat> Lord, <clears throat> in your mercy. Hear Gracious God, you have promised to be with your people even unto old age. Grant that those whom you have blessed with the gift of many years may even now be moved the more to join in thanking you for all the bounty of your overflowing hand. Continue to uphold them, Lord, with strength and dignity, and move us to show to them the honor that is due them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. O Christ our King, in your blood, the saints of all ages wash their robes and find entrance to paradise with you. Bring us also with them out of death and the grave and into resurrection and eternal life at the last day, when we will see you crowned with glory. For you are the Lamb who was slain and now lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We continue the service with the service of the sacrament on page 160. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. 
We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Holy Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on us. Send your Holy Spirit on us that he may establish in us a living faith and prepare us joyfully to remember our Redeemer and receive him who comes to us in his body and blood. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. For our hymn before communion, before distribution, we sing number 620.
table. Take, eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. And drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul for life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. Welcome to the Lord's table. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. The body of Christ, given for you. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul. The life everlasting. Depart in peace. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. The body of Christ, given for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. That's peace. Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul. Life everlasting. Go in peace. Welcome to the Lord's table. Body of Christ. Given for you. strengthen and preserve you in body and soul the life everlasting depart in peace We mentioned Simeon earlier in the service, and here we use the song of Simeon as we continue our service on page 165. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people. 
a light to reveal you to the nations, and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We close with a hymn that's a typical evening hymn, but it's really talking about our own lives as we draw close to the end of our lives. As it moves from, well, we'll sing about it. 878.
alert you to the fact that um, next Sunday is the first Sunday in Advent. Um, I'm going to let my brother preach for me next Sunday. No big deal. Uh, and uh, following that will be the beginning of the Advent season, our midweek Advent services. So we hope that you'll be thinking and uh, planning for that as well. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.